Are we live? It looks like I'm live. Right. Welcome back to my fart font part. Wow. Uh, font parsing and rendering project. Uh, so last time we parsed the head of the TTF font file. Uh, today we're going to start working on the glyphs. Uh, I don't think we're going to finish it today. Uh, first of all, this is going to be a short stream. So I don't think we're going to finish it, uh, and I really don't think we're going to get to visualizing the fonts at all on today's stream. Uh, but we're going to start to parse the glyphs, like at least the number of points that make up each glyph. Uh, that's that's the very first thing that you need to, need to know about glyphs. Uh, before we get into that, a quick update on the last stream. I figured out what was wrong with my Corbelli font file. So I noticed that its length, you can see the length right here, is not divisible by four. Uh, so Corbelli is this one. It's the italic version of Corbel. So it's not really pronounced Corbelli, it's Corbel and the letter I for italic. Uh, but I like to say Corbelli anyway. Uh, so the standard Corbel font this length and the length of every other font file that I have on my system, it's divisible by four bytes. So, uh, by the way, the quick way to tell if a number is divisible by four is you only have to look at the last two digits and then figure out if that number, 68 in this, this example, is divisible by four. Uh, so every multiple of 100 is div divisible by four, so that's why you only have to look at the last two digits. And then every multiple of 20 is also divisible by four. Uh, so we know that 60 is divisible by four, and then 68, 64 and 68 are both divisible by four. 690, uh, or just 90, you only need the last two digits for the italic Corbel font. That is not divisible by four. Uh, and here is, this is not the original Corbelli. I've actually fixed up Corbelli by padding it with a couple of zeros at the end. Uh, so if I go back and undo what I've done to this font file, I can try to parse that font. Uh, I copied it out of the Windows directory because those are actually read-only. You can't change those. You have to copy the file somewhere else and edit it elsewhere if you want to edit those system fonts on Windows. Uh, so I copied it into my scratch folder here, and if I try to parse the original one, uh, that's not great. Let me recopy it to make sure I have the original. So the Windows font directory is C Windows fonts. So I'll copy that. I don't know what's going on with my permissions here. There we go. So now if I try to parse this font, it crashes. Uh, well, actually, it's not crashing anymore, which is an improvement. Uh, earlier in the previous stream, we were getting a stack trace right here. Uh, first of all, notice I, I did uh, color-coded errors. Uh, and if you don't get an error, you'll get to see my green color-coded text, which I also did off-stream. Uh, so I have color-coded output, at least for those two scenarios. Uh, but it's not crashing anymore. I have my own error handling, which spits out this message, and it says there's a bad checksum for the head table, which means it's a bad checksum for the entire file. Uh, so that's an improvement on crashing. And if I... If I hex edit this file, okay, I just did something funny there. Did I change my keyboard layout? I did something funny there, so let me open it up from scratch. Uh, so if I hex edit this file, percent bang xxd, first of all, it warns me that I'm looking at a read only file. Uh, so the file ends right here. If you remember, it was something 90 bytes. 
Uh, so if we want to pad that up to a multiple of four bytes, we can add two bytes of zeros at the end here. Uh, remember two hex digits or two nibbles is one byte. So that's a nibble, that's one more byte, and then that's two more bytes from what we originally had. So then I can write this file, and then I can undo the hex formatting. Uh, so you just add dash r onto the end of that original hex edit command. And that will take us back to the raw binary file. We can write that again. And then if I go back and parse this Corbelli font again, that parses just fine. So I don't know what it is with this particular file. Uh, I've seen some font renders that crash on this file. I've seen other font renders that work on this file. I don't know if those other files are entirely skipping the checksums. I don't want to do that. I still want to verify checksums. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe I should automatically pad the, fi uh, the file with uh, bytes of zeros if, it's, if it doesn't have a length that's divisible by four bytes. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what the correct thing to do there is. Uh, I haven't found any documentation on TTF files that mentions this scenario. So if you're a TTF expert viewing this right now, let me know. So I, I guess the correct thing is to pad, but I haven't done that yet. So for now, uh, the thing that happens when I try to parse uh, the system font file, that's not what I wanted to do. For now, I'm just erroring out. Uh, that's also not what I wanted to do. Too many command arguments. Yeah, so the thing that I'm doing right now is I'm just er erroring out in in cases where the length of the file isn't divisible by four bytes. Uh, by the way, here's that green text that I mentioned when uh, the program can parse the font file successfully. Uh, so that's what we should get with most font files. Out of like 300 fonts, font files on my system, Corbelli is the only one that has this issue. So I don't know if it doesn't conform to the TTF spec or if my program is wrong and it should be padding with zeros. Uh, Anyway, let's get into the, into the thing that I actually wanted to do on today's short stream, which is starting to read uh, like the number of glyphs from the glyph table. Uh, so uh, again, I'll have this, I'll have a link to Steve Hanoff's blog here in the description of this video. Uh, if you're watching on Twitch, I'll have these videos archived on my YouTube channel. Uh, so check my links to find my YouTube channel. Uh, you can always view the old streams there if you're interested. Uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, then you can already see the description right below the video. Uh, so go there to find a link to this blog. Uh, I'm following Steve's blog uh, to figure out how to parse TTF files because this is a little bit shorter and easier to read than the full TTF file specification. Uh, so this is what I'm working with. Uh, and Steve is doing this in JavaScript, but I'm fine with that. I, I can I can look at this JavaScript code and translate that to Fortran easily enough, I hope. Uh, I'm not done with it yet, so we'll see. Uh, the thing that I want is, let's see, he has draw glyph, but draw glyph calls read glyph, uh, but before that is get glyph offset. But even earlier than that, and I think this is not covered in, in this blog, is the number of glyphs. So if we look at Steve's draw glyph function, he has this inside a loop that goes to the font length. Uh, and I don't think his blog covers how to get the length. The length is, as far as I can tell, this is the number of glyphs in the TTF file, and I don't think he covers this in the blog, so for that I have to go to the spec, and that is in the max p table, I believe. Uh, so if you look at the Apple documentation on this, uh, basically there's a section on each header tag, like ACNT is a tag, ANKR is a tag. Uh, the one that I'm interested in is max p, uh, so you can click each of these 
in the documentation outline, and that will take you to the documentation on that specific table. So for the max p table, uh, basically the second number in the max p table is num glyphs. Uh, that's what I need to get, the number of glyphs. And once I have the number of glyphs, then I can uh, formulate a loop that reads every, every glyph in this font file. So let's dive in. So I'm going to put this towards the end of my read TTF function, just before we close the file. Uh, I did a little bit more work off stream. Uh, hello, said who 13. Welcome to the stream. Thank, thank you for tuning in. Yes, this is Fortran. Uh, this is Fortran. Uh, the blog that I was looking at a second ago. Uh, yeah, this thing, this is JavaScript. So essentially I'm translating this JavaScript into Fortran uh, because Fortran is one of my favorite languages. It's definitely the language that I know the best. Yeah, so these are things from the head table. Uh, and then next I want to jump to the, the max p table, because the max p table has the number of glyphs. Uh, I think I need some error handling in here, like if the head table doesn't exist. What do I like more, C or Fortran? Uh, I haven't really programmed in C that much. Uh, I, I have used C++, but not really C. Uh, I like, I like uh, that C and C++ give you low-level access, like they give you direct access to pointers and memory addresses. Uh, Fortran doesn't really have that. Fortran has something that they call a pointer, but it's not really a memory address in the same way that a C pointer is a memory address. Uh, so things like that uh, I, I prefer about C. Uh, but th there are other things that I like about Fortran better, like Fortran is really good with multi-dimensional arrays, uh, some people say that Fortran is an array-oriented language, so that's that's my favorite feature of Fortran. Uh, if if I had to pick one or the other, uh, hmm. If I could only pick one, I, I guess I would go with C. Uh, I I, th I think they say that familiarity breeds contempt, and I'm more familiar with Fortran, so I'm more aware of the limitations of Fortran. So maybe if I knew C better, I would say. I would pick Fortran. I don't know. Makes sense. i never written in Fortran myself. Uh, yeah, I think not a lot of people have. Uh, it's, it's an old language. It, it's still under development. It still gets updates. So there are modern, there are like object-oriented features in Fortran now that didn't exist back in the 1970s in the original versions of Fortran. Uh, but yeah, uh, most people think that it's an old language. Uh, there aren't that many Fortran programmers, so I think that's normal. So this is how I seek to the head table. And then the next thing I want to do, yeah, yeah, formula, Fortran is short for formula translator. Uh, I, I guess the idea that they had originally was that they just wanted to do math in this language. So they would have like a mathematical expression like uh, uh, z equals a times x plus y. Like maybe you have something like a times x plus y. And they wanted to write it just like this in a language that didn't exist at the time. Uh, so one of the only alternatives back then, Fortran is older than C, so C wasn't an option. Uh, the only alternative they really had, I think, was assembly. Uh, I can't remember what languages are older than Fortran. I think Algol and COBOL might be older than Fortran. Uh, they came out around the same time, so I'm not sure which one was first. Uh, but the only option they had was assembly. And if you wanted to do this in assembly, this would be like, at least two or three lines, like you would have to do the multiplication as one line of assembly, and then you would have to do the addition from the previous result as a separate line of assembly. 
uh, and then maybe store that in Z might be a third line of assembly. Uh, I don't really know assembly well, so I'm not sure if that's two or three instructions. Uh, but people wanted to write formulas like this in a higher level language. Uh, so back in the day, Fortran was a higher level language compared to assembly. Uh, and because people wanted to put in mathematical formulas, they call it formula translator, and they shortened that to Fortran. Yeah, yeah, Lisp is pretty old. Uh, I always forget about Lisp. Uh, I'm scared of Lisp with all those parentheses. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about where the name Fortran comes from. Uh, they used to spell it with all caps too, like Fortran. Uh, the modern way to case this is you just capitalize the F, the rest of it is lowercase. You don't have to shell anymore. Yeah, uh, I usually hear good things about Lisp. Uh, very, I played with Lisp very br briefly uh, before I really knew any other programming languages other than like MATLAB or Fortran or something. Uh, so I, I should give it another chance, or, or, or maybe Haskell, if I want to learn a functional programming language. I think Haskell is a little bit more modern than Lisp. You like the customizability? Uh, yeah, I, I hear that in Lisp you can like write programs that modify themselves, and that's something that's special about Lisp. Okay, so after reading the head table, I want to jump to not head, but max p. Uh, and then I need to declare this. One thing, one thing, another thing that I like about C and not Fortran is in C, if I wanted to declare a new variable, max p here, in C I would say int max p just in, in, in line right here. Like I have a whole program up here and I can declare it right now. Uh, but in Fortran, you can't declare things in the middle of a function. You have to declare everything at the top of a function, which is pretty annoying because I have to like scroll up or jump up somehow and then go up here, declare my new variable max p and then jump back down uh, to, to the body of my function. Uh, so I like C better than Fortran in that regard. Oh, are you working on fonts? You're doing the same thing as I'm doing in your project. Are you are you parsing TTF files in C? I think this should compile. Oh, a few years. Uh, don't watch me. I, I only got into fonts like last week, so I, I know nothing about what I'm doing here. Uh, everything that you see me doing here, I'm learning like right now. Only parsing a few tables, tables needed for shaping. Uh, that's probably what I'll do. I, I'll probably only parse the tables that I really need. Uh, the stuff that I want is in the glyph table. So I'm not quite there yet, but I want to get the glyph table. And then once I get that, I, I might ignore everything else. It, it depends how far I go with this project. Uh, I don't want Corbel. I want a good font file. Uh, yeah, so Computer Modern is the one that I'm using for testing by default, uh, the Computer Modern font from LaTeX. So. You are writing an open type font shaping library. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know much about fonts, but I know that there are true type font files and there are open type font files. Uh, so I, so I kind of just picked one and I decided to go with TTF for correctly rendering other scripts than Latin. Yeah, uh, I'm undecided on what I'm going to do with uh, other scripts. I'm working in... Uh, since I'm working in Fortran, uh, Fortran doesn't really support Unicode. So if I want to do anything that's not ASCII, I'm going to have a hard time. So I, I might just limit myself to Latin. I haven't decided yet. Open type or just true type fonts with a few extra tables. Uh, 
I, I feel like there are enough tables in here. There are like 19 or 20 tables in most files, uh, and I don't think I'm going to read all of those. So I, I think that's enough of a challenge. I, I don't need to further complicate the file format. Okay, so this compiled. I think this should have jumped to the max p table, and then I need to figure out what do I have to read from the max p table. Uh, oh, we've got a link to a project. Uh, so first there's a version, which I can sort of skip over, and then the number of glyphs is the second thing, and that's at uint 16. Uh, the gsub and gpause tables. Uh, rules for replacing glyphs. Is that related to like simple glyphs versus compound glyphs? G pause is glyph positioning. Okay. Ah, loading the G subtable. And this is, is this C or looks like C? Maybe C. It, it's a header file, so I'm not 100% sure. Looks like C. Cool, th thanks for the link. I'll, I'll have to check out your project. Oh, ligatures. Pure C. Yeah, uh... I don't know if you watched the uh, Twitch streamer Soding. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. It starts with a T. Uh, he was doing a project on a on a graphics library written in Pure C. Uh, so I, I was watching that right before I started this project, and I thought, well, I, I don't want to copy exactly what he's doing, uh, but he started working on like a basic bitmap font, and I thought, well. Uh, Oh, okay. To contribute to uh, to your project, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it. I'll check this out later. Yeah, so uh, Soding was working on another project in Pure C, so I was watching that and got the idea to work on fonts. So fixed. I can't remember if I have a reader for a fixed type. There, there are all these types in C that Fortran doesn't have. So one of the hard things is I have to convert from the C type to a Fortran type. Then a fixed. Okay, fixed is just int32. So even though fixed is the same thing as int32, I think previously I was just using like a git int32 function. Uh, oh wait, no, it's, it's fixed point. So, so this is like a, a fractional number. Yeah, uh, I, I I should I should do a project in C. Uh, I've done projects in C plus uh, plus. I, I should try something in C just for fun eventually. Yeah, yeah, you're planning to optimize your library. It's it's a it's it's a side project, right? It, it's not for work, so we always have limited time for these projects. Okay, so I do have a read fixed function. So the first thing after max p is read fixed. Oh, for the last three years. Usually I don't work on a side project for three longs for, for three years. Uh, usually I work on a side project for a few months and then I lose interest in it and I move on to something else. You got married, so not much time for these things. Uh, congrats on the marriage. Uh, I, th I think that's probably worth the time rather than spending all your free time programming like I do. Where was I? Uh, max P. So I want to read fixed. Uh, let me call this the max P version. I don't know if I need to save all of this data in a struct. 
I guess I might as well. That's my convention. So what do I want to name this? Naming things is hard. Oh, UTF-8 decoding with x86 ARM. Oh, for your for your font project. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about Unicode. Uh, Fortran doesn't support Unicode, so that's my excuse. Like, my language doesn't support it, so I can't do anything with it. Yeah, uh, what I'm working on, it's not really unique. Uh, so, like, people can parse font files. Like, this isn't groundbreaking. People, The file format exists, so people know how to read it. Uh, so I'm not doing anything new yet. Uh, I'm going to render the fonts, or at least I would like to, once I get it parsed. Uh, but that's not new either. Like, people can render fonts. I'm, I'm not doing anything unique here. Yeah, so if you're doing something unique, then that, that's more interesting. It's supposed to be a shaping rendering library uh, that's small and fast, even for embedded. Yeah. I haven't really worked with embedded systems with a Vulkan and GL renderer. I haven't worked with Vulkan before. Is is that like an alternative to OpenGL? I think I want to rename version to just verge vers because I like to be not so verbose. Yeah, replace that one. Okay, there are only three of those. So this should print the max P version now. Okay, Max P version 1.0. Uh, I'm, I'm storing this as a double, so I have way more precision than I need. Uh, but I don't want to have, I don't want to have like a complete one-to-one -one correspondence between the TTF types and then the types that I'm using in Fortran, because Fortran doesn't have unsigned types, so I can't represent everything one-to-one -one anyway. So I, I might as well make some simplifications and just treat everything as like doubles and 64-bit uh, integers. Okay, Vulcan is much more low level. Yeah, it was created in 2016. I knew that it was newer than OpenGL. The vendors, the vendors have to implement the driver for those APIs. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with graphics for this project. Uh, I, I think I'm going to write things to like a PPM image and then just open the image, the PPM image file in some other program. Uh, I mean, there, there's not really a good way to work with graphics directly in Fortran anyway. Yeah, GL is old, well, relatively old from 1994. I've worked with OpenGL a little bit. Uh, I, I started working on a Tetris game in C++, and I was using OpenGL for graphics in my Tetris game. Uh, but but I, I, I had a bunch of bugs in that project, so I gave up on it and moved on. Yeah, yeah, it, it writes an image. That, that, that's the easy way to deal with graphics. Just offload it to some other program. Okay, so I have the version, and then the next thing is the number of glyphs, which is what I actually want. Uh, and what was that type? So version is fixed, and then glyphs is uint16. call this n glyphs u16 
Yeah, you can write something manually, but it's not always feasible. Writing a PNG loader and writer is not trivial. Uh, for PNG, I use I use a sub I use uh, somebody else's library called Load PNG. Where is Load PNG? The problem is it's in C. So if I want to use Fortran, then I have to like write my own interface to the C functions. This is what I use for PNGs. Uh, I've also seen people use STB headers for PNG. But yeah, like it's not trivial. Uh, PPM is easy. Uh, I haven't done BMP before. I think PPM is even easier than BMP. PNG is complicated because it has compression built into it. Uh, I, I, I've seen some cases where uh, writing PNG can be faster than writing a PPM because it's compressed and then you end up spending less time doing the input output STB image. Yeah. Oh, STB has a font loader too. That's cool. I, I'm trying to do this with minimal dependencies on third parties. Uh, so I'm, I'm parsing the font myself. It could be a bad idea. Oh, it doesn't do open type features. I want to be consistent in my naming. I have num tables, but then I'm doing n glyphs. So I think I want to rename num tables to n glyphs. Oh, you have Arabic fonts mostly working. Yeah, yeah, it's a good exercise. Arabic is tricky because that's right to left as opposed to left to right. And I know I know that that's, or at least I think that that's stored somewhere in, in the font file. True type is too overcomplicated. Open type is even more complicated than true type, right? I think I want to rename this. So num tables, just n tables. All right. Oh. Wait, so does does true type have G sub? I thought I thought I had G pause at least. Is it just not documented here? I thought my tags here. Okay, yeah. I, I do have G pause and G sub in this TTF file. But I'm looking at the Apple documentation for TTF and it doesn't have this documented. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's somewhere else. Glyph mappings. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's so much documentation here and it's like overwhelming to look at all of this. So that's why I'm I'm going on this guy's blog instead of reading the Apple documentation straight from the source. They're like commands, it's like a state machine. OpenType is complicated because it requires a lot of custom code for every language system. Yeah, Indic, Tibetan, Arabic, Japanese. The curves for the glyph contours are written as a program in the file. I, I think it's, isn't it similar with TTF? Yeah, I, I think TTF is the same where you have to build your own. Well, they, they give you like the control points for the Bezier curves. And then if you want to like trace an outline of that, then you have to do that yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's TTF. Okay, so it's... So open type is even more complicated than that, where they give you commands. So it's even more abstract. It's worse than that. <laughs> okay, 
I, I think I made the right decision though with picking TTF. Uh, I, I wasn't really sure. I just kind of picked one. I, I guess I picked the right one because that sounds really complicated. Like, like you have to write an interpreter for a programming language to be able to parse an open type font. Okay, so I renamed a bunch of stuff. I want to see if this still compiles. Oh, and I, I should have the number of glyphs now. So that's new. Nope, that didn't compile. I messed something up. And glyphs, yeah, I forgot to declare end glyphs. See, I, I'm being lazy here. Uh, this is how you make an 8 byte integer in Fortran. Uh, integer kind 8, so the 8 means 8 bytes. Like you don't say int 64 like you do in most other languages. You, you say the number of bytes. And I think it's not guaranteed. Like on some systems this might give you an 8 byte integer and on others it might not. Uh, so I'm being super lazy and just doing everything as an 8 byte integer where I could like save memory and just use 2 bytes or 4 bytes depending on uh, which part of the TTF struct I'm saving. Oh, the true type instruction set. Oh, the Microsoft documentation. Yeah, I've, I've mostly been looking at the Apple documentation. I haven't looked at Microsoft's yet. Okay, they have opcodes. This looks complicated. This will be a good exercise for me. Okay, this is the correct documentation. So is this better than the Apple documentation? Oh, this is so long. This is crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, Microsoft came up with it? Okay. Wait. Okay, I, I, I was mistaken. I, I was thinking that Apple came up with it, so that's why I was looking at the Apple documentation. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't realize that this was actually Microsoft. Oh, this is oh this is this is open type, but then it has a section on true type, because uh, I think like some of these formats can contain the other format, like true type was originated as a unification of various other formats. That that's one of the reason there are so many different tables, and why like the version or the checksum isn't the very first thing in the file. It's like buried within one of the sub tables. Open type is Microsoft. Okay. Yeah, I was confused because I was looking at this true type instruction set and I thought this whole thing was true type, but now now I see like the higher level open type section. Uh, okay, so I declared that. I think this should compile now. There we go. Okay, 700 glyphs. I think that seems reasonable. Uh, got another link. True type glyphs. Okay. This is like the section right before the last one.
Interesting. Okay, so 700. I want to figure out if that's correct. So I'm using this website called Font Drop, and then I can drag my font file into here to verify that I'm getting the same information that other people are. So if I look at data and go to max p numglyphs 700, I got that right. Now what's next? Okay, so I have, I have the number of glyphs, which was not covered in this blog. So I had to go to the Apple documentation for that. Uh, And then once I know how many characters are in the font, then I can iterate over those and load and then draw one glyph at a time. So I think I want to do something similar to this. In this blog, he, uh, he doesn't save the glyph data. He, uh, he reads the data and then renders the character and then discards all of that data and reads the next one. Uh, so I can do the same thing on this website that I did in the last one where I drag and drop a file uh, and he renders it. So he renders one character at a time, uh, like he renders the exclamation mark, and then he discards all of that data and then he proceeds to the next one. Uh, so, so I think I want to do that differently. I think I want to actually save all of the data so that if I wanted to typeset text and like I had the letter A in two different places, I wouldn't have to read the letter A twice. I would just load it into memory once and then uh, go back to my structure in memory. You can see, I don't know how much I can zoom in here. Uh, this guy is totally ignoring the Bezier spline data. He's just working with control points and then using straight line segments in between the control points. Uh, so that's a simplification. I'll probably do that at first before I get to the Bezier splines, uh, but eventually I would like to get into the splines. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't really knock this guy's blog. I, I don't want to throw shade on him because this is like my number one learning resource that I'm using as I'm getting into this. So like, you have to make simplifications, otherwise the blog is like so long that nobody wants to read it. All right, we've got a YouTube link. I'm, I'm saving all these links in open tabs. So, oh, this is your video. Let's check this out. Cool. Is that Arabic? Oh, this is like what Soding did later. I watched Soding's video where he did like a Minecraft style font. Uh, so I haven't seen anything that he did with fonts after that. I, I've only seen like the, the bitmap font. He didn't even finish that. He made like four or five letters and then got bored with it and moved on. So like he spelled aboba and then I don't think he did any other letters that are outside of those four or five letters. He's using the GPU. Yeah, I, I probably won't use the GPU. I'll probably just write a PPM file. Cool. Okay, so I, I want to refresh the page so that I can hide that rendered font. Okay, there we go. So there's this draw glyph function where he iterates over everything. Uh, so I think I can do something like that. I just need to iterate over all of them. Oh, the article that you followed is in that description. Let me go back to that. Oh, signs distance field. Yeah, I didn't know what SDF stood for.
Hmm. That's an interesting animation. What is MSDF? Somebody else is researching it. It's only in the comments, though. It's not mentioned in the article. Yeah, I, I assume that whatever I do, it's not going to be optimal in any way. Uh, so, so the problems that you're de dealing with with optimizing your code, uh, I'm just doing this as a side project, which is not unique in any way, so I probably won't get around to optimizing it. MSDF is multi-channel SDF. Okay. Oh, that was, oh yeah, Saeed. Okay. I, I, I was misreading your username. I, I thought it was said who, I didn't realize that it's Saeed. Sorry about that. I, know, I have this window open in the background now that I want to minimize. There we go. So, n glyphs. Okay, now that I have the number of glyphs, I can iterate over those. I think I already have i for my table loop, so I don't have to declare that again. It's fine, yeah. I'm gonna have to parse code to get the curves. Yeah, I, I think, I think TTF is not as complicated as open type. type. Uh, I was looking ahead here. No, that's the wrong table. Where's the glyph table? Yeah, so that they have an array of the endpoints of each contour. So that tells you basically how many points are in each contour, like whether it's an outer contour or an inner contour. Uh, and then there are instructions. I, I don't really understand what instructions are. But then eventually they just give you a list of x coordinates and y coordinates. So it's it's not like I have to interpret a program to get the coordinates. The coordinates are just right there in the file. It, it's for simple glyphs, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are simple glyphs and compound glyphs. And then a compound glyph has a reference to other simple glyphs. But a simple glyph is just uh, x and y coordinates like this. I have to parse the instructions. OK. <laughs> there are no shortcuts. Well, if, uh, if, if I do what this guy does on the blog, where I treat everything as straight lines, then I can sort of ignore some of the instructions. So th that's what I'll do first. Uh, I'll have line segments first, and then I'll get the uh, the Bezier curves correct. Okay, so I can loop. And I can read the first one, and then I actually want to stop as soon as I read the first one because first I want to see if I can read one glyph, and then. Uh, I'll go on and handle the second glyph in the loop. Yeah, I can yeah, I, I can ignore it at first. So the first thing is getting the offset of the glyph. And then that is from the loca table. You relied on STB true type. Yeah. 
yeah, there's no need to rewrite this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing this for fun. So any sane person would not write this from scratch, especially not in Fortran. They would use a library to do this. Yeah, SDB is like a header, right? So you include one header and then that messes up your compile times because everything is in a huge header file. Okay, whatever I did with max p, I need to redo that with loca because I need the loca table too. Oh, actually, it's pretty fast because the file is small. I, I just assumed that stb was a huge header file. Uh, load png. I, I think it's also a single header file. Do I still have that open? I think I closed it. Load png. Well, I... Hmm, 2,000 lines. That's not bad. I thought it... Hmm. Okay, I, I must be thinking of something else that's a single header file. Oh, you don't trust it with managing memory. Malloc and free. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not doing anything efficient with memory. Uh, I'm using 64-bit integers for everything, even the stuff that's just one byte or two bytes, using up a lot more memory than I need to. Okay, I need the loca table, so replace all of those with loca. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you want something done right, do it yourself. I don't know if that's always right. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's better to use a library. I, I would hope that there are well-developed libraries that are already memory efficient. I should have the, nope, that didn't work. Already fixed end glyphs. You don't use any rendering features from STB, yeah. Why didn't this compile? This compiled before. I don't know what just happened. You only use STB to load the font, yeah. It's, it's inside the struct, yeah. Oh yeah, so you can be a lot more memory efficient because you don't need the whole file, you just need the tables that you're interested in. All right, yeah, uh, thanks for tuning in. I, I really appreciate the, uh, the viewers and, and the interaction. Have a good night. Okay, so that compiles and it runs now, so I think it jumped to the loca table. And then I need to read something. See ya.
I guess I need to read the glyph offsets from the loco table. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Index to log format. I think I have this saved. Yeah. I name everything differently. Okay, I don't necessarily want to seek right here. I want to seek inside the loop. So I just need to check whether this is one or something else. What table is this from? Is this from the head table? So I wanted to know what table it's in so I can look up the documentation. So head. Zero for short offsets and one for long. So that makes sense with this. So zero is a short offset, one is long. Just thinking of whether I want to handle errors if it's something besides one or zero. I think it's not really that important. Let's just translate this into Fortran. Okay, the first seek is redundant. Because I don't need to jump to the loca table and then jump to the loca table plus index, I can just jump straight to that specific index. Four times i makes more sense than i times four. And then we need this thing. Tell it it's an absolute seek, not a relative seek. 
So that's for, I think it more, makes more sense to do the short one and then the long one. So this is a two byte jump per index. This is a four byte jump per index. And then we get a uint32. Should I have like a local variable named offset? as well. Read U32. Okay, good, I have that. Oh no, this, this will be 16. And this will be 32. That did not work. Great, it's a member of the struct. Okay. That ran, it did not crash. I wanna see which offset I'm jumping to. say glyph offset equals whatever this is. This should print something. I don't know what it's going to be. Okay, so 148 and that's in hexadecimal. So which font am I reading? So my run script just looks at the computer modern font by default. So I can look at that. copied here. Okay, I like having all my fonts copied into the scratch directory too. And then hex edit this. Alright, what was the offset? It was 148. Right, 148. So what is there in the hex file? Here's one, four, zero, one, two, three. All right, let's count by twos. Zero, two, four, six, eight. So at this offset, there's just zeros. Don't know if that makes sense or not because I don't know what the next thing I read from the glyph is. No, so that's relative to the glyph table offset. Hmm. Well, that seems like it. Okay, so with that, they're able to store everything as shorter integers. So that's why it's compressed like that. So this offset is relative to the glyph table offset. And then I need to add that. Does that make sense? Because one four zero. This is like right in the middle of some other table. You know, like this is right in the middle of the GDEF table, right? It's between offset one three C and one five eight. So if that was a an absolute offset from the beginning of the file, that wouldn't make any sense. So this needs to be plus the glyph table.
I don't think I have this saved anywhere. Now this offset should be different, 2D48. So this should be the first bit of data in, in the first glyph, if I've done everything correctly so far. <clears throat> and then what am I expecting to read in the glyph? Is it like the number of contours? Yeah, first is the number of contours as an int 16, and then we have x and y bounds as f words. I think I don't actually have a get f word function. And I might want to add that even though I, I believe it's the same, it's just the same as some other type. Like I forget whether it's in 16 or in 32. Uh, but just for compatibility with all the documentation, I think I want to have a get f word function or a read f word function. Uh, but first is the number of contours. So I think. This seek should be redundant, right? So 2d48, it should still be 2d48. That's the offset. And then, then we're going to read from there. And then what am I reading? Uh, UN 16. It's the number of contours. And I think I probably want to save an array of glyphs. Uh, I don't have that much time tonight. I only have about 20 minutes. So I might not make an array yet. I might just try to read one glyph or, or the number of contours in one glyph. Uh, and this is glyph number one, so that's not super interesting. I might, I might hunt and peck a few different glyphs to see, to see what's in this file. So number of contours is UN16. myself because I don't really have time to finish this totally tonight. Uh, I want to put this inside a struct and I want to make an array of glyphs. It has to be allocatable because we don't know what the number of glyphs is until we read the file. For now, uh, this is just a local variable. It's not part of a structure or an array of structures or anything like that. And I didn't declare that. I, I don't even have to read the error message. 
I know exactly what I forgot to do. Because this isn't my first rodeo with Fortran. I've been around the block a few times. See, I told you I knew what the problem was. Two contours in the first glyph. And unless there's something funny going on with the C map, I think the first glyph should always be this thing. Can they do this with two contours? That doesn't seem right, does it? I feel like you need more than two contours to make a box with two diagonals. What's up, Callie? Here's the namesake of the library. This is my cat, Callie. But actually, the library is about calligraphy, so it's not really named after her. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight, eight glyphs in a row here on this website. Kelly Twitch doesn't want to see your butt. I'm sorry, you have to get down. It's okay. Oh, she tried to bite me. She's just playing. Is there another glyph that I could look at that would be more interesting? I think a lot of these are going to be two contours. Uh. Like, a single quote, that's obviously one contour. A parenthesis, those are probably going to be one contour. Zero would be two contours, because it has the outer contour and the inner contour. Uh, something like a hash mark? I'm not really sure. Would you do that as four contours, one for each of the, each of the straight lines, or would you do it as two contours for, like, the outer thing and, and the hole in the middle. I don't know. So like some of these you could encode it in equivalent ways with different numbers of contours. Can I like get, oh, does it tell me, it has contours data, but it doesn't really tell me, huh. See, this looks like it would be five contours because you have one going around the outside and then you have four holes in the middle. So that's five contours total. total. Okay, so they have five boxes here for each contour. Uh, so that it would, it would appear that I'm not doing something correct. Is it because of the index, which is zero instead of one? I think, I think there's like a C map or some mapping array that I'm totally ignoring. So when I'm looking at glyph one, it's not actually the first glyph here. Kelly. Kelly, it's okay, Kelly. I'm only going to stream a little bit longer. Printing this in decimal, not hexadecimal. Okay. Oh. So if, if it's a, I forgot this multiplied by two. Oh, come on, not, not them keystrokes there. There we go. Is, is that all I had to do? 
Well, that's different. 79. That doesn't seem right either. <laughs> I think no matter what I do, it's wrong. Oh, no, I, I put that in the wrong place. This is the one that's multiplied by two, but I, it, it, it's still wrong, right? Yeah, so now we're back to two. I think two is better than 79. But two is plausible, 79, that's, that's too many contours for a Latin glyph. So he seeks either times four or times two, and then I have these inverted because I think it makes more sense to have the short one first. Why don't I print this? I think I already have this printed somewhere. Index to load, it's one. So that means it's not the short version, it's the long one. That makes sense because when I accidentally put the times two right here, it changed. So we seek to the loca offset plus the index times four. And that's an absolute seek. And then we read a uint 32, and we don't multiply it by anything. If it's short, we multiply by two. Otherwise, it's not multiplied. Then the offset is relative to the glyph offset. So let me print these I mean I'm pretty confident that these exist but I'm not doing any error handling if the get table thing fails So we have glyph and we have loca so there should be defined of numbers. Uh, if, if there's an error, then they would get returned as negative one instead from my get table function. And my glyph offset is 2d48. Does that make sense? Yeah, actually that does make sense because then what do we read? We read an int 16, right? I read in 16. So that means I read two bytes, which is just two. So that, that looks okay, but like which glyph is this? I, I don't actually know. Now what if I look at the second glyph instead? instead again two contours third glyph two contours that's that can't be right where is I 
I is right here, so that should be something different. Why is it why is it like reading the same data? It's saying two D four eight every time. This is weird. This is wrong. It's like this, well, it's this C because it's, it's the 32 bit version. It's like this seek doesn't do anything. So we have this two two five eight four eight. Two two five eight four eight two two five eight five two. So that's something different. But then this read is always reading the same thing, apparently. One four eight always reads the same thing somehow. <clears throat> there are a lot of occurrences of one four eight. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Then what do we have in this font? One, two, three, four. Hmm. I was thinking maybe they're all white space, but there's an exclamation mark eventually. So that's different. Right, this this is a different offset now. That's different. It's still two contours. Uh, but I, I like I have no idea which character this is. Like that should be two contours. That should be two contours. Right? And if we look at like the contours data here. So apparently they have like one gray box per contour. So this is one contour, this is the second contour. Uh, and that makes sense with the way that they're visualizing it here. So that could be two contours. This is also two contours. Uh, this number sign, that's two contours. Do we have anything that's not two contours? This is, so the dollar sign should be three contours. And this would be the eighth glyph, as long as there's not some other map. It, excuse me. So let's see what is at the eighth index. It says four contours. I don't know if that's right, because it's not a dollar sign. This is three contours. 
percent is four contours. So is this just off by one? I, I think this is off by one. Okay, this is starting to look okay. So this is five contours for glyph zero. So I think this loop, this loop actually needs to go from zero to uh, n glyphs minus one to account for the indexing, which is not the native way that things are indexed in Fortran. Because character zero uh, I mean this this is just like a dummy. This is the actual loop that I want to do, and here I'm like commenting and copying it so I can look at different characters. So if I look at character zero or glyph zero, not character zero, it says five, and that makes sense because this thing is five contours. Right? One, two, three, four, five. There's the outer contour and there are four inner contours. Uh, and then we have stuff that I'm not really sure how it's defined. Like we have a bunch of white space. Uh, first of all, glyph one is undefined. That's like part of the TTF spec. Uh, this glyph has to be a box. The next one has to be totally undefined. Uh, so I'm not sure how many contours should be in there. So zero, one, two, three, four should be two contours, and five should be two contours, and six are all two contours. So if we look at, uh, let, let's just put in like zero through ten. Uh, this is probably printing. What did this do? Oh, I, I have stop at the bottom. I have to take out the stop. Uh, I think I want to clean up more logging. I think I can straight up delete this JavaScript. Is that all that I want to comment out? I think I can delete that. Yeah, maybe not. Not quite yet. Let's leave it in just to be safe. I'm going to have to end this stream soon. But yeah, we have five contours. Two, 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 two. Uh, two, 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 two. This two makes sense. And then we should have one more two. We should have a two for number five, zero, one, two, three, four, five. We should have two contours on glyph five. Uh, Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Six is also two. Six is also two. And then seven should be three contours. So we have a three, and we have a four. All right, this is. Does that make sense that. Yeah, okay, so we have outer, inner, outer, inner. Yeah, that's four contours. And then back to three. This is three? Okay, yeah. One, two, three. They, they don't actually tell you like number of contours here, but you can figure it out by counting the gray boxes or, or just looking at the glyph in most cases. Sometimes it's ambiguous. I think sometimes you can't tell just by looking at the glyph. Uh, and then what's next? Then we should have one contour. And that makes sense, we're, we're back to one. So I, I, I think I'm getting the number of contours correctly. Uh, when I, do I wanna loop through all 700 just to see what happens? First of all, I'm printing out a seek somewhere. I think I want to just print I at the very top of the loop. And why not? Let's just let's just do all of them and see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't crash, like it might crash, I, I don't know. What? That 
that seems sane. Like it's mostly no low. It's mostly low numbers, like one, two, or three. Here we have like a seven and a five. Those are a little bit more than some of the simpler glyphs. An eight. So it's it's parsing data. It's not crashing. The numbers look sane. Uh, let, let me just spot check one of the final ones just to just to do a little more verification. So the last one should be three contours. I scroll all the way down and I just page down instead of this is three contours. Yeah, that's three contours. That, that's that's a ligature. Uh, and then what was before that? It's two. So the last two are three and two. So it looks like I'm parsing this correctly. Uh, I'm going to commit this quickly, uh, even though, I mean, we're not parsing the whole glyph yet. We're just parsing the number of contours that are in the glyph. And then we still have to read the coordinate data and, and a few other things like instructions. I, I changed the loop for the head table verification. Uh, so if the file isn't padded, I don't crash. Uh, I, I just get the wrong checksum instead without padding. So I did that off stream. I will probably go back and clean up the logging at some point. But I'm running out of time, so I just need to commit this. Got to watch Better Call Saul. I'm, I'm, I'm in a lot of suspense right now. I'm on like episode six or seven of, of season six. So things are getting interesting. contours correctly. I think that's it. Let's see if the CI gets started. And then I will end the stream. Got a yellow dot. There's a yellow dot. How's you bunt here? But you should finish first. It's building, printing tags. Uh, oh yeah, this should be exactly the same as what I ran locally, except uh, GitHub won't show you the entire log if the log is too long. Uh, apparently somewhere around a thousand lines of logging. It's like, that's too much data. We're not gonna show you all of it. So yeah, that worked. Uh, I'm gonna end the stream right now, so. Uh, thank you to everybody who tuned in, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.